As we look at the limitations of, of radiology, bone loss is only going to be detected according to uh, Bender and Seltzer if the lesion is big enough to hit the cancellous bone. And that lesion needs to be big enough to, to get to the junction of the cortical and, and, and cancellous bone. It needs to impact the cortical plate. And when we look at uh, Ron Shoha's work, this is uh, OOO, 1974, uh, lesions were always larger radi in the clinical finding than they were radiographically. And lesions were evident before the junction of the cortical plate. So this is in direct contrast to the previous article that I just showed. Certain teeth are more prone to exhibit radiographic changes than others, and this is definitely the case. I did a uh, periapical surgery on a tooth number nine today, and at following reflection of the flap, the apex was fenestrated through the cortical plate of bone. Even with my limited uh, surgical skills, I could find that root end. Of course, that's going to be uh, significantly different than when treating a mandibular molar through a thick buccal cortical plate. So I think that's absolutely true. 7% uh, mineral bone loss needed to produce a radiolucency, and lesions need to be a certain size. Uh, one to seven millimeters didn't produce a, a lesion in the cancellous bone when looking at this Bender study. So is there a way that we can do better if it takes a lesion one to seven millimeters before we can actually see it? Well, cone beam certainly can be advantageous. I'm sitting in my cone beam room right now. You can see it right behind me. You see it on the screen and behind me. And when we think about the limitations of cone beam, are there limitations? Well, we know that it's an accurate way of detecting apical periodontitis. I've got a couple of articles sitting on this slide, but there, there could be 25 or 30 or 50 articles. We, we know that this is the case. We know that CBCT is going to be an enhanced way for us to determine if there is disease in the periapical region. It doesn't tell us what that disease is, but it certainly is a more precise measure. And when we look at Bruno Acevedo's work and compare what we see with cone beam compared to what we would see with uh, conventional imaging, we see ex excellent accuracy when detecting simulated lesions of 1.4 millimeters in diameter. Okay, So where we basically couldn't see anything 1 to 7 millimeters, now at 1.4 we're seeing excellent accuracy. So this is clearly a, a better way of determining if there is subtle change in the periapical region. But is that perfect? Well, PDL spaces of healthy teeth demonstrate significant variation when examined by CBCT. So that opens up some level of subjectivity. If there are variations in the PDL spaces from tooth to tooth in healthy, when we're looking at very small and subtle changes that may be pathology driven, it then becomes difficult to maybe make that call, especially when I consider CAFI et al, which was my sort of go-to article when interpreting lesions on 2D films, constantly I'm looking at the PDL space in lamina dura. Is the PDL space intact? If I see the PDL space is intact, I'm going to think that there is no periapical inflammatory disease. I'm basically going to call that bone normal. So if there is variation on the cone beam in the PDL from normal to normal and normal to abnormal, it makes my life a little bit more difficult when trying to interpret the cone beam. So there are limitations certainly to 2D imaging. I, I, I do believe there are limitations to 3D imaging. And what does that leave us with? As we look at this particular case, and now I don't know what this represents. Okay, This is an image that I pulled off the net. I have a pretty good idea of what it represents based on the fact that there's bone loss splayed into the roots. It appears to be a young individual. We're dealing with the mandibular molar region. This is sort of pathognomonic for a traumatic bone cyst. But the bottom line is, I don't really know what it is, nor do I need to know what it is. All I really need to do is recognize that this is abnormal and then seek some sort of appropriate care. Whether we believe that to be endodontic care or oral surgery for a biopsy, whatever that might be. But the bottom line is, from a pathology standpoint, I'm going to recognize all of the things that are there embryologically and know that any one of these things could, can potentially go haywire at, at any time. So we've got odontogenic epithelium in the area. Certainly this could represent an odontogenic sister tumor. We've got glandular elements that are potentially part of a dentigerous or other odontogenic cyst. 
there's smooth muscle elements, nerves, arteries, veins, any one of these things can potentially lead to this sort of pathology. And all of those things would then be considered in my differential diagnosis. So all I really need to do is recognize what isn't normal and then hopefully seek care and move that patient in the right direction. Do something about it, be proactive. So this is a picture of my brother's leg. We were going to a basketball game a, a few years ago in Wisconsin, middle of winter, and it's snowy and icy. And he took a tumble in the parking lot on the way in. And I looked down at him after I got done laughing at him. And his the bone was sticking out of the side of his leg. And it was a, a, a pretty gruesome and horrific event. I felt sort of bad for making light of it. Um, he got put back together, as you can see here. But the bottom line is I, I didn't know how to fix him. All right, I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. I didn't know what to do, but I did know to call 911. So I recognized that something wasn't normal, did something about it, and ended up watching a, a basketball game in the ER. So when talking about radiographic interpretation, you know, things that I want to remember as someone that's seen some of the weird in the wild is that common things occur more often than uncommon things. For several years in my residency and then clinical practice, Every time I saw someone with any sort of atypical change radiographically, I thought it was going to be horrific and bad disease because that's what my filter was. That's what I had experienced for several years prior. It's important also from my perspective for me to remind myself that some things that look very similar are indeed very different and some things that look very different are actually the same. And I'll show you a few examples of that as well. And I also am constantly reminding myself as I look at these things and we talk about demographics, that 100% is, is, is not 90%. These are differences. So when something occurs in a specific spot 90% of the time, that doesn't mean that it can't occur someplace else, right? So presentations are very different. They're unique to the individual. So back in my early days, I would look at this bone change radiographically on the distal of 19 where it's extending vertically and I would be thinking, boy, that's, that's gotta be something bad. It's not just this well-defined radiolucency at the apex, it's a bigger deal. So that must be something weird or wild. And after doing this for a few years, you know, you start to see trends repeat and here we have a deep, filling history, no response to pulp testing, and on entry, it's a necrotic pulp. It's nothing more than a root canal scenario, even though early on in my career, I think I wanted to make it a bigger deal. Root canal is done, it's followed up, and we see great healing of the bone in the periapical region. This is an example to illustrate how some things that are, are, are looking different radiographically are actually the same thing. So here we see these 90 degree trabeculations in the maxillary anterior region, that 90 degree trabecular pattern is pathognomonic for odontogenic myxoma. This is another example of an odontogenic myxoma, likely with some superimposed periapical pathology in tooth number 19, but you see a, a more multilocular radiolucency posterior mandible, another odontogenic myxoma with a multilocular presentation and expanding the mandibular area, and another myxoma with no 90 degree trabeculations, no evidence of expansion. So we see four things that look very different radiographically, yet present and would behave in an identical manner from a symptom standpoint, a treatment standpoint, and the potential for recurrence. As opposed to these two things that look somewhat similar, but are actually very, very different. In the on the radiograph on the right, where we see this sort of well-defined radiolucency, these teeth are non-responsive to all pulp testing. This is a trauma case, several years post-auto accident, and endodontic treatment would be very appropriate, in my opinion, for these teeth, as opposed to the area on the, these areas on the radiograph on the left, all of those teeth are normally responsive to pulp testing. They respond to electric current. There's no history of trauma. And this represents periapical cementoosseous dysplasia. The lesion on the left is a classic presentation of nasopalatine duct cyst with the splaying of the maxillary centrals and the pear-shaped radiolucency 
as opposed to the lesion on the right, where we see endodontic access openings in both eight and nine, but significant ill-defined bone destruction and a destruction of the hard palate that actually represents a poorly differentiated sinonasal carcinoma. So those two things look somewhat similar, but would have an incredibly different treatment plan and expected outcome. Mm -hmm.